You are listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Good to have you aboard on this Monday. Cattle market commentary now for you from Lee Schultz. He's along with us this time around. Lee is a livestock economist at Iowa State University. It's a rather quiet scene, to be honest about it, Lee, when we talk about market influences. But we would start with the bullishness that was evident in the cash and the futures markets last week as the market wrapped up. And I would really put emphasis on as the market wrapped up, as we look at Friday's trade, we we did see quite a bit of strength in the futures prices. Really, that's when we first started to establish the cash trade for the week. We finally seen prices here in Iowa trading at 124 to 125. In Texas, you've seen 124. Uh, Nebraska cattle in the range of 119 to 124. So first really establishing that, that trade late in the week, I think it did take a bit of the bullishness, a bit of the certainty in the futures trade to help establish what that market was. Really what we're still staring at big time in this futures trade is the huge discount between that April and the June live cattle futures contract. It reached historic levels this last week at at over $18 spread um, on Thursday. You go back to 1980, that's the largest that that spread has been. Hmm. What does that signify, do you think, then, when we talk about such a historic difference between those two contracts? That signifies the market is expecting a large amount of market-ready cattle to to start coming to the market. And really, that's what is being reflected in this market is the big transition expected. Now, I think, as we've seen, demand can absorb a lot of that expected increased production. So that's really the question over the next several weeks and maybe even months of where do we see that June trade, and even that can go into July as some of those June cattle can be delivered into July. What does that really establish as trade when we see what the supply of these cattle are? As you look at currently, actually, producers that are short-hedged on the June contract, really the basis levels have been a dream for them. So we've actually seen some cattle that have been sold already, sold ahead for May delivery because we're seeing such strong basis levels. I think we could see those basis levels continue. We had last year, we've seen basis levels upwards of $15 in May. And so just because that June contract is priced at such a big discount doesn't say we're going to see some convergence in there because cash prices are so strong right now relative to what the futures are. If those cattle come in one or two large waves, though, that could not bode so well for the cash fed trade. Is that not the case? That is the case. I think really what what we're looking at is right now it's up to May 28th, um, which is Memorial Day. So we know demand is going to be very strong there. We know that packers are going to be ramping up kills uh, to fill a lot of those sales. And so really seeing if packers do start to pull some of those cattle ahead uh, may be an indication that we will spread those marketings out a little bit. But you're correct. If we get post May 28th, and we are still choppy trade in that 104 to 106 range for June. I think that could even pressure further as we get into June. That makes it even more imperative that retail beef demand domestically remain firm, if not stronger, as we get into these summer months and, of course, what we talk about frequently, the grilling season. It it is, and and actually last week I think was a pretty good sign that we did really see ramp up in demand. We've seen the choice cut out upwards of of over 6 to $7 higher than the week prior. you really seen the rib and the loin very strong on that cutout, and you're starting to see a lot more retail promotions, and so I think that that's going to help trigger that demand a bit and help push those prices higher. We've seen quite a bit of strength in the cutout value, and what that's given is very strong packer margins because we've seen fed cattle trade pretty stable the last couple of weeks, but some strength in those margins. So I think packers are interested in ramping up those kills, and that could help a bit when we look at those cash prices because they have an incentive to do so. We're seeing some strength in, in that cutout value. Very good. Quickly glancing at the feeder cattle auctions, the cash trade this past week in Kansas anyway, there was something of a mixed bag there, but uh, by and large, a uh, higher tone in that market. And what do you think is at work in that trade currently, Lee? Well, I think it's a bit of we, that cattle on feed report was neutral to a slightly bullish, the, the one we had uh, 
just some short time back. I think that helped out feeder cattle prices, especially in the futures market this last week. And we've seen a little follow through on, on cash prices as well. Also, I think you're seeing cattle feeders are really setting their sights on some of those summer grass yearlings. That's helped some of that, that demand there. Um, and overall, I mean, I think at least we've seen some profitability here the first couple of months from the cattle finishing standpoint. And so I think that's allowed producers to bid those profits back into some of those feeder cattle. So that's kept those prices fairly strong. Well, Lee, we want to spend some of our time this week looking at an analysis you've worked up on cattle feedlot capacity. As many in the industry or those who watch it know, we've had an excess of bunk space in the feedlots for a few years now, and you've come up with some information to indicate whether or not that's changing. Share that with us, if you would. Well, this information comes from the, the February cattle on feed report, uh, which reports the, the capacity in U.S. feedlots of, of greater than 1,000 head capacity levels. And so it, it's consistent with what's, what's reported in the cattle on feed report. Uh, I don't think there's many surprises in, in what was released. We've seen capacity utilization increase the last couple of years, and that's not too much of a surprise, as, as mostly we've seen more cattle available to be placed in those feedlots. But we've also seen a, a slight reduction in the number of feedlots, especially when you compare 2016 to 2017. Most of that has come in the smaller feedlots, um, and so it's feedlots less than 1,000 head or on that range of 1,000 to 1,100 or so. And I think why we've seen reduction in those number of feedlots is because it's become pretty expensive to place cattle on feed. And so we've seen them back off a little bit, especially from 2016 into 2017. And so I think from a factor of decreasing the number of feedlots and increasing the number of cattle on feed, that's helped the, the capacity utilization. But also we're still have excess capacity relative to historical levels. And why I think that's an implication for the current markets is that excess capacity is allowing for these feeder cattle prices to maybe remain a little bit higher than the markets would suggest. And because there's adequate bidders out there for those feeder cattle. And so I think that's why we're maybe seeing a bit of a mismatch between what feeder cattle currently are at and what the live cattle futures or live cattle expectations are suggesting those feeder cattle prices should be. So looking forward, and even considering where that capacity stands here in the early part of 2018, what does the industry need to watch for here as an indicator of the healthfulness, if you will, of the cattle finishing sector? Well, I think it's important that we wring out the excess capacity, and that's important because that really dictates the health of, of the industry. And I think we've seen this a couple of years back with the packing industry. So there was a lot of excess shackle space, um, and that, that was causing many issues in the industry. We've really rectified that considerably, and I think we're in a better situation as far as feedlot capacity utilization. But I think as we go forward, it's really important to see that these cattle are placed in strategic areas relative to where cattle slaughter areas are. I think we're starting to see that match up a little bit more as the percentage of the U.S. herd has moved north. So I think really looking at the strategic nature of where the cattle finishing and cattle packing is, is going to be very important as we go forward. So this week's trade, what do you think the markets will key on as driving factors? Well, last year this time I looked through my notes and, and we were talking demand, mm -hmm. um, and that's really what was driving the market. We're really in, in the flip side of that this year is the market's really priced in this bearish supply scenario. And yes, we have more cattle than we did a year ago, but I think we're in a similar demand situation where we're in that ramp up for the, the summer grilling and, and looking at Memorial Day now. So I think right now that's the wild card. Um, it's demand. I think we had maybe an indication this last week with very strong cash trade. Finally, late in the week, we also seen very strong box beef trade. And so that could be a signal that we really turned the corner here in demand in into May. So really looking forward is maybe last week helped set the tone for where we're going further. Also, I think it, it's big. We're transitioning from 
the April contract into the June contract here. Um, and so seeing what happens on the board will be very important as, as we know some positions are going to be rolled ahead and some of those other contracts are maturing here this week. So I think this week's a very important week as kind of a transition into May and, and what's going to be benchmarked against the June contract. Good insight, Lee, and we will catch up with you again in the not-too-distant future. Many thanks. All right, thank you. Joining us on this part of agriculture today, Lee Schultz. He's a livestock economist at Iowa State University and among those who contribute thoughts to the cattle trading trends for us each week. You're tuned to the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Each year, the Department of Agronomy at K-State conducts what's called the Kling L. Anderson Lecture. Now, this series honors a longtime and acclaimed researcher in the area of grassland management here at Kansas State, Kling Anderson, and it brings in individuals to talk about grazing management and associated topics. And this time around, the honoree is from the Environmental Protection Agency, and he works as a senior research engineer with the EPA's Office of Research and Development. Brian Gallette is his name, and welcome, Brian, first of all, to K-State. Good to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Appreciate it. What you'll be talking about at the Kling Anderson Lecture, emissions from prescribed burns in the Flint Hills and characterizing those, and we want to talk about some of those finer points there, but your background as an environmental scientist, it goes quite a ways back itself, doesn't it? It does. More years than I wish <laughs> to acknowledge. I'm actually an environmental engineer. I worked for the agency since, uh, since 1985. So you've been with it for quite a while. Yes, I have. Yeah. In what areas of research particularly? Uh, my specialty is air pollution, uh, measurement of air pollution, combustion products uh, from industry, from open burning, etc., this ties very well into what you'll be speaking about at the lecture here very shortly. It does, and it's been a, an interesting career, which has uh, transitioned uh, from gas-solid reactions and combustion all the way to uh, the Flint Hills in Kansas. Talk about your experience with smoke emission research, then, in particular. What's been your key interest? So uh, in the last 10 years or so, we've been trying to focus more on understanding emissions from open area sources, which are less understood than industrial sources. The agency has focused uh, on its early formative years on industrial sources and, and also automobile sources, uh, mobile sources. And more recently, we are recognizing that there are many open area sources which are poorly characterized and uh, need to be better understood. And among this would be something like smoke emissions from prescribed burns? Exactly. So we have been looking at uh, biomass combustion for past 15 to 20 years. And more recently, the advent of new technology has enabled us to go out and to uh, sample open area burns. So this is a fledgling area of research in a lot of ways, isn't it? Uh, I would say yes. So the, the challenges were initially to sample emissions from sources that ended up high in the air. And that is certainly the case for some of the initial sources that we're focusing on. Well, then what are you looking at specifically? What elements of smoke, what traits, characteristics, what are you exploring here? So we're trying to understand what the pollutants are and what their concentrations are and also what their emission factors are. Now, the emission factor is the amount of pollutant that's formed, the amount of mass of a pollutant that's formed divided by the amount of production of a unit. And it might be the amount of pollution per number of widgets produced, or in the case of open area agricultural burning or forest burning, it might be 
the mass of a pollutant per area that's burned. And so that's what we're focusing on now. When pollutants are referenced here, what elements are we talking about specifically? So we're focused on a whole host of different pollutants. The more obvious ones are carbon dioxide, PM, or particulate matter, uh, nitrous oxide emissions, but also gets a little more esoteric when you start looking at uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or volatile organic compounds, uh, chlorinated dioxins and furans, and even metal emissions. So there's a a pretty wide range of uh, pollutants that we're looking at. It all depends on the source. What do we know and what don't we know about all of those then? That's a wide open question, but what are the key areas of exploration here? So for open area sources, we don't have a lot of information because the technology has only developed considerably in the last 10 years. So it's very hard to measure emission factors from a lot of these sources. Traditionally, we we in the agency have been able to sample industrial sources by putting a sampling probe into a smokestack and measuring the emissions. But in open area sources, they're obviously wide areas, they're diffuse, and they're not contained, so it's hard to get a uh, flux or an amount of pollutant that proceeds from, say, burning a field. So it's pretty difficult to do that. So how does one as a researcher get their arms around that, technically speaking? So there are a lot of different methods that have been developed, uh, principally in the last 10 years. There are some what we call open path measurements that actually uh, measure across a line of sight. And more recently, uh, my team, since 2010, has been developing sampling methods that are actually aerial sampling methods that go up into the plumes of the fires, uh, if that's the source, and sample actually in the plume itself. Presumably, unmanned aerial craft, such as, well, we call them drones, have lent greatly to that uh, yes, they have and they can. Uh, I will point out that the uh, the EPA actually does not have authority to own, operate, or contract for a unmanned aerial system, UAS, or as you call it, a drone. Uh, we have done some sampling in the past in which another agency has hired a drone operator, and we were able to put our sensors on those systems, but the agency currently doesn't have the authority to do that themselves. And that must be extremely sophisticated, that instrumentation. It is. Uh, we first started putting a custom-built instrumentation on a helium-filled balloon. The balloon was 5 meters in diameter or about 16 feet, and it's, uh, it was tethered to the ground. And the instrument that we developed weighed up to 55 pounds. It depends upon what sort of pollutants we are measuring how many pumps we would put on there, et cetera. But it was a custom-built instrument, and uh, it was very versatile. And we have actually adapted that with a new technology that has miniaturized sensors and computers uh, to about a shoebox size, which can weigh between 5 to 9 pounds, and that actually can go on somebody else's uh, unmanned aerial system or a drone. And typically, the drones that we would like to use these on are what they call multi-copters. That is, they're like helicopters in that they're vertical takeoff and landing. And the reason for that is, uh, as opposed to a fixed-wing drone, uh, this allows us more flexibility in terms of getting into and then actually staying in the plume where we can maximize our sampling efficiency. Well, Brian, from what is known to this point, what is the lead concern from smoke emissions, say, from prescribed burning or other open burning? Well, of course, prescribed burns in most cases are essential to uh, reduce fire risk and to maintain ecosystems. But we're trying to understand how to still undertake prescribed burning, but to minimize the amount of emissions. And so the things that are really unknown are what is the smoke character as a function of for instance, time of year in which something is burned, moisture conditions, uh, and even how the fire is conducted. So these are variables that affect the amount and composition of the pollutants, and this is what we're trying to figure out. And at that point, the tieback can be made to prescribe burning management, hopefully, uh, to minimize the output of those uh, contaminants. Yes, absolutely. That's the intent. I mean, prescribed burning or 
fires in general, of course, are a sort of a natural part of our ecosystem, and we're trying to understand if they are es- essential, then how to d- conduct them in a more proper manner to minimize any potential pulmonary or cardiac effects that they might have downwind. So what is the next phase or the next step in your work then? Uh, Just continuing on with pursuing the questions you brought up just a second ago? Yes. uh, There's a lot of variables that need to be tested in order to understand emission factors and and as all the burn variables affect them. uh, That's what we're trying to do. We're also trying to incorporate new sensors that uh, serve other purposes. So for instance, the agricultural field is interested in fluxes of uh, nitrogen-based compounds from fires, uh, from ammonia, for instance, uh, even methane themselves. And so we're trying to incorporate new sensors into our sampler system. It would appear that the thought is that prescribed burning and smoke mitigation can operate in harmony at some point down the road. I think that's the general intent, yes. That's what we hope to see. And what you'll be conveying in this lecture very shortly will be the technology and the goals, basically, right? Yes. Well, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the risk of wildfires, uh, prescribed fires, and the challenge in in sampling these emissions uh, accurately and representatively. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the new research that we're trying to conduct to understand these fires in a better manner. There's probably some exciting new technology around the corner. Uh, Yes, there definitely is. Uh, So, uh, for instance, uh, LIDAR technology uh, enables one to uh, understand the the fuels better and to map the pollutant fluxes through the air. And so we'll we'll be able to get a better quantified uh, handle on what the emissions are. Good to have you here at K-State and presenting the Kling Anderson Lecture on this topic. And Brian, thank you for your brief time with us right here. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you very much. He's from the Environmental Protection Agency. He is a senior research engineer with the EPA's Office of Research and Development. He is talking at K-State about characterizing emissions from prescribed burns in the Flint Hills region. Brian Gillette on Agriculture Today. We'll be back in a moment with more on the K-State Radio Network. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. As part of the 2018 4-H Ag Innovators Experience Monarchs on the Move Challenge, presented by National 4-H Council and Monsanto, students in Kansas, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, and Nebraska have been trained to help other youth develop critical workforce skills as well as demonstrate how agriculture can be fun. The Cottonwood District, which serves Barton and Ellis Counties, received a grant to be part of that training. 4-H Youth Development Agent Susan Schlichting and Bernie Unruh are overseeing the program, and Unruh says their first task was selecting three teens to go to the national training. And then we were asked to come back and train 20 youth, and those 20 youth have been asked to reach 50 other youth, and so we are hoping to reach 1,000 young people with this uh, Monarchs on the Move program. How were you able to identify the youth who should be leading this effort? We sent out applications, advertised it, and we had six young people apply who wanted to attend the training in Iowa. So we interviewed them and chose the ones that we felt like were able to take some leadership responsibility and also to speak easily. And then we also had applications for the other 20. We actually have 22 total who are working on the program right now. The whole concept here is to get youth involved in what we call STEM. What do we mean by STEM? Science, technology, engineering, and math. And Monsanto definitely is also involved in that because they do believe that we want young people to not only work on those projects, but also to be involved in agriculture. And agriculture, lots of agriculture is involved in the science programming. 
I think one of the things I saw was also the fact that they want this to be fun, so you're looking at fun activities. It definitely is. And I could have Susan share some of the programming things that we have been doing. We um, have been taking this out into the after-school programs here in Hayes, and the kids have different stations that they set up, and the kids then rotate around through the stations and talk about simple things like reading the Very Hungry Caterpillar book, you know. So most kids know that book, know the story, and you can talk about it and relate it to how it works in real life with the monarch butterflies. We also have a station where they have an activity with a simulated milkweed plant and the different hazards that a butterfly would encounter as they are growing out of the egg to the caterpillar stage and on to becoming a monarch and how all those hazards along the way can keep them from actually developing into a full-fledged monarch butterfly and talking to the kids about how hard it is for that single egg to become an adult butterfly. And the kids have a great time with that activity and I think get the point really quickly that it's really not an easy thing to become a monarch. There's also a planting station where the kids get to plant milkweed and coneflower seeds and they learn a little bit about how you grow plants, then they get to take those home and hopefully they grow into plants that they can then transplant out into their gardens. So just a number of different hands-on activities that tie back into pollinators and helping kids understand the importance of pollinators in their world and in helping to develop those kinds of habitats for a healthy food supply in our country. What age group are we targeting here? We've been working with kindergarten through fourth grade approximately in after-school programs, but I've got several kids on the Hayes team that are planning to go into high school classes to work with their peers, talking about uh, using technology like drones and mapping techniques to identify where you should place a garden or you should plant milkweed plants in order to entice the monarchs. We also will have some middle school type activities coming up as well. In addition to reaching out and finding our 1,000 youth that we want them to learn about the habitat and how to take care of all of nature. We also are hoping to reach out to the global community, and so we were challenged to to find a way to either talk to young people in another portion of the world, either globally through Skype or something like that. We are actually going to have an event at Cinco de Mayo Day here in Great Bend, and many of our young people even in our 4-H program, speak Spanish very well. And so on May 5th, we hope to be a part of the Cinco de Mayo celebration. And one of our young people is going to read the book, both in Spanish and in English, and then also talk about the decline of the monarch population. They overwinter near Mexico City. And so many of our young people are familiar with Mexico. And I think that will be really important to them to know that they have our vested interest in finding a place and and also keeping that place in Mexico available so our monarch butterflies have a place to overwinter. And then when they come through Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and on up to Iowa, that we have places for the caterpillars to feed. So planting the milkweed plants is a very important part. And so at Cinco de Mayo, we will be planting little plants, and hopefully they will take those home and find a place to plant a milkweed plant. The monarch butterfly seems like a real good tie-in and really something that the kids can kind of wrap their heads around. We have posters from Monarch Watch that I think specifically show each step of the life cycle. And to me, that is really fascinating. But for the kids to see up close, it really shows how important every step of nature is. When we had our training in Hayes with our 22 young people, Lynn Campbell from Iowa State University was able to actually check out the butterflies and the chrysalis and the caterpillars from the USDA Monarch Rearing Facility in Ames. And so that was an amazing way for our young people to see the actual monarch butterflies and and the caterpillars. And so I think the fact that those 20 young people got to see the real life cycle, when they are teaching it, they explain that to all of the young people that they're teaching. So the whole program has been really amazing. And you're going to continue this program through the summer? Yes, we'll be taking it on the road. We actually have a team of our kids are coming into Discovery Days at K-State at the end of May, and we'll present to their peers. 
We'll also be taking it to 4-H camp with us as our Heart of Kansas camp goes into camp at Rock Springs. And then we also will be at the Insect Spectacular in Wichita at the end of June. So a number of places that we can reach out and, and share it with the kids across Kansas. One of the really neat things about this whole project is the teen leadership component, being able to train 22 teenagers to go out into the communities and take the message out to younger kids. It's a powerful thing, and and already in the the few sessions we've seen a lot of growth and confidence in those teenagers and their ability to teach others and to share a message. That's Kansas 4-H Youth Development Agents Susan Schlichting and Bernie Unruh with the Cottonwood District serving Barton and Ellis Counties. More information about the Monarchs on the Move Challenge is available at the Extension offices in Great Bend and Hayes. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.